Hello, welcome to The Wire. I'm Raghu Karnad, and today I'm doing something that I have not ever done before, which is that I'm having an interview and a conversation with a filmmaker. But Varun Grover is not only a filmmaker, he is also a stand up comedian and a poet and a lyricist and a writer. He's one of the best creative minds of my generation. And sometimes I, t sometimes I describe him as my favorite public intellectual in India. So what I want to do with Varun, whose film All India Rank is now in cinemas, is talk about three themes which the film deals with very beautifully. And those are sex, violence, and dreaming. How does that sound, Varun? Wow. Okay. First of all, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I don't know. Okay. We'll ignore that. Uh, we'll <laughs> get straight to the <laughs> film. So, yes, I think those are, uh, yeah, those are definitely three themes in the film, apart from a couple other themes. But those are the themes I've not really talked about a lot. And it's going to be fun talking about. That. But actually, I want to start by talking about violence. Okay. okay. Yeah. The heaviest. Let's start with violence. Yeah. It is. But uh, in this film, it isn't the heaviest, which is, uh, which is something that a lot of people liked about it. So for me, the experience of watching All India Rank started before the film started, mm -hmm. while I was sitting in the Juhu cinema and the trailers began. Mm -hmm. So the trailers... I don't know if this is all trailers or just the particular trailers that are running right now. It's all the trailers all that run year round in, in right now. That's that's what the scenario is, but I yeah. know what you're saying. You know what I'm gonna say. I was sitting in the seat like recoiling because of the kind of machismo and the aggression and the the the, the intense visual style that was like yeah. battering me off the screen. And then when the film started. Suddenly, it was like all of that, that, that atmosphere left the room. Yeah. And it was a huge relief. Hmm. So, there's something that's happening in cinema more, more broadly, or it just characterizes cinema more broadly, hmm. that this film is stepping away from. Is that right? Yeah. Also, so one, not, it was not deliberate to make a film which is non-violent and which is you know which kind of looks different from all the other films it was probably their choice to make violent films and not my choice to not make a violent film so uh, for me the film any film uh, the kind of stories i want to tell masan was the first film i wrote like uh, and masan had violence it had violent cops it had a violent society it had uh, in some ways, very, very traumatic events, uh, you know, which we see all around us. So, violence is part of our society. But for me, uh, while making this film and generally telling stories, it is very important to see the world from a slightly tender lens and find humanity in the world around. But I want to always do two things. One, contextualize it in the period and in the aspirations or ambitions or failings of a society or the people or the characters in the film uh, so that we know where it is coming from or you know what, what is the origin of it. It's not just what we call mindless violence for a lot of films and it's kind of now seen as a as a quality of the film that it is full of mindless violence and fun and you know the if all the films not all the films but a lot of films which are you know the big screen adventures right now you can all you can make a mashup of a two hour film and call it thousand one ways of uh, spilling blood or something like yeah. that you know and they are getting more and more innovative using all the new technology which the cinema and which the scientists are giving us to make the world look more beautiful. They are using that to make blood spilling look more innovative or beautiful. Uh, I don't want to go that route. That is just me. I'm not, you know, that kind of a person. Secondly, this film especially is 
about the origins of a mass hysteria that mass hysteria which eventually became the success industry in india what was the origin and the origins are kind of violent in a way hmm. you know psychologically then it just so happened that we released in theaters at a time when uh, actual that's the thing i i didn't want to go straight into to this subject which is the heaviest thing that's happening in our world right now but yeah. it but it, it's hard not to think about because uh we've been watching this in situation india. in gaza play out for yeah. for uh for months now and what it feels like is that there's suddenly an ideology becoming visible in the world in which incredibly destructive violence is not meant to be seen as actually hurting people yeah. and that ideology seems to match something that happens routinely in in visual culture in cinema yeah which is that you know which is that you could just show someone getting having the hell beaten out of him yeah but not really experiencing pain and injury and yeah. and wounds and recovery and and what happens to a human body yeah. there's something about the human body that gets completely removed from the uh fr- from our philosophy of violence yeah. yeah uh which has become so troubling right now because mm-hmm. it doesn't feel like it's a joke anymore yeah all india rank did have moments of violence yeah and i could i would like to, i mean I, i wish i could discuss each of them one by one but those would probably be spoilers it's okay we can discuss spoilers i uh, think yeah. matlab it's okay i mean i believe all india rank especially is a film which you can't spoil because it's it's a i don't know it's a coming of age films you can't spoil but i know what you're saying so in in especially that one scene where a kid tries to harm a woman and uh, it is it could have been very violent if you know if he made a very violent choice in that mm-hmm. moment so he does not but he still you know it is a very scary moment and to deal with that scary moment in all india act there is a whole scene of parents talking about what could have been and that leading them to what else could have been in their lives if they had not sent their kid away and you know so that becomes a trigger for going into a deeper conversation about how they have lived their lives and which is what exactly as you pointed out is missing from a lot of films where violence is there but violence is uh made to seem like it doesn't hurt it there's no emotion violence minus emotion is there so it's emotional absolutely uh whatever burden or pain or weight of of violence is completely taken away from you know when you see so much action and the way the action is portrayed and then there are no repercussions also in fact you know this one scene there is an action scene and you know you actually see hero getting beaten up and bruised and all and in the very like 10 seconds later they are dancing and they are enjoying and there's no and which is what exactly which is why a lot of violence which is happening around the world is uh, kind of we are desensitized to it uh, yeah well yeah desensitized reminds me of something else that happens in the film which is not a spoiler is that he plays mortal combat yeah. and then i remembered the kind of traditional critique which is these things desensitize us to violence hmm. i don't know whether they really desensitize us to violence but i do feel like we're totally confused mm-hmm. by the culture about what violence is and what mm-hmm. violence does mm-hmm. and the scene we're talking about where someone aggresses there, there's a bit of aggression the two people aren't even in the same frame mm-hmm. she's not physically hurt but you know enough about her you know enough about her house and her family mm-hmm. that you understand that this this little shock mm-hmm. uh has physical repercussions for her yeah uh that 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 it that it that it brings out anxiety and and you know and that and you can see because you have these wonderful actors you mm. can see her body also respond to yeah. it in a way that is true to our bodies let's say yeah mm. a little violence 
actually goes a long way in this world. Perfect. I think we have forgotten how how painful physical violence is. We, I mean, so many people applauding in theaters. Sometimes I also do, you know, seeing big action films, and you you enjoy that. But that kind of makes you forget how painful even a prick from a like paper from, cut. Yeah, a paper cut. Oh God, that's the most horrible thing that can happen to I think a, a normal uh, non-violent person, like that's just true. someone who has not dealt with any kind of violence in life. Paper cut is horrible, but even like when, when you're, you're getting, writer, when you're giving your, <laughs> when you're giving, uh, giving your blood for for a testing or something, it's like so scary. And the the same people enjoy, you know, this absolute crazy violence. I'm not judging them. I'm I also enjoy a lot of times, but then we kind of forget that what real violence is. Yeah, actually, or how real real violence is. How real, real violence is. Yeah. Exactly. Coming to our next subject, sex. So, nobody has sex in All India Rank, as uh, I'm pretty sure, right? But there is a atmosphere uh, of of arousal and curiosity. The mystique, yeah. possibility, the idea of sex fills a lot of the scenes. Yeah. And that's very appropriate because the characters we're following are how old? Like, are we doing 16? 17, 18. 17. Yeah, 17 actually. Yeah, 16, 17. And for most people I knew, I know uh, at that age, that is exactly what life is like. You're not actually having sex. It is entirely... Yeah, but you're something. thinking about sex. You're thinking lot. about sex. Yeah. And your body is uh, is more or less consumed or controlled for large parts of your waking day yeah. or night yeah. by sex. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to I wanted to ask you a question. Can you guess who are the two characters in the film that I thought about the most in this context afterwards? Most interesting. Wow. Okay. Um, the father? Being one of them, no? Could be. I mean, you okay. could. I mean, you're, you're the director, so there's no right answer. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but okay, tell can, me. Okay, I'll tell you. One was uh, the troublemaking boy. Yeah. What is his name? Uh, Mohit. Mohit. In the film, Sadat is the actor. Right. Sadat Khan. I thought that was a great character in, to include. And we'll come to that. Yeah. The second was Bundela Ma'am. Wow. Lady who leads the coaching classes and it's at the front of the classroom. Yeah. Uh, you have any idea why? I'm wondering why? how much of this was conscious. Uh, uh, so no, Bundela ma'am, yeah, I'm quite intrigued. Maybe this is just me. Bundela ma'am is played by Sheba Chadda, right? Yeah. And I thought that in her performance, I was getting a, a teacher who's seen partly, as seen partly through the view of a room full of adolescent students. Mm -hmm. Maybe I thought Shiva Chadda looked like kind of a really hot teacher, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and certainly her performance was uh, was was light and playful, teasing, mm -hmm. a little flirtatious. Mm -hmm. I'd love to know what uh, how much of this is her intention and how much of it is my imagination, yeah. but. I, but I thought it, it immediately brought back to me how all pervasive and kind of, kind of boundaryless attraction and arousal can be when you're that age. So this was definitely not deliberate, but as I say, all interpretations of a film are correct. There's no right interpretation which only belongs to the writer or director. Every interpretation tells us something about the film and tells us something about the people who are watching the film. So it's absolutely, I mean, I, I'm, I'm fascinated Maybe by this. Maybe too much. Sorry, Shiba. <laughs> no, that's great. But what we try to do, which could give that reading into that character is, so uh, when we, uh, when I was researching for the film uh, long back, 2015, I went to Kota just to, you know, just to see, meet students, meet teachers, see the ecosystem. Uh, and then I kept going back to Kota every couple of years, three years, four years. And the one thing I noticed, which is uh, 
I mean, which is through across academia in STEM, there are no women. There are very few women. Uh, not no, but yeah, very few and very few in positions of power. At the time or that even today? Well. And at the time, though, obviously, but even today, so you see, if you are seeing 100 holdings of superstar teachers in Kota, like in say maths, in say physics, in say chemistry, just giving a random number, 100 is probably they, they have 500,000, 10,000 holdings. But out of 100, 100 feature men. Uh, so that was one subversion we definitely wanted to do deliberately to put a Bundela madam there as not just the best teacher at the time but actually someone who act, who started this culture uh -huh. in Kota of Kota becoming a coaching town. So that was something we wanted to do and at the same time we wanted to stay away from the nerdy type. There is a nerdy type uh, nerdy of type. women, right? Yeah. Which is there, they are, there is a very strange female uh, trope in cinema that was deliberate that she should come across as just a human being who who enjoys teaching physics, who is who is in love with her life and who loves her job, and she's she's getting to do that. So that was the intent, and which now I can understand why it can go into that direction also that she does not fit the stereotype of a studious physics teacher. Okay. Well, I'm glad to have contributed a new interpretation to the film. But yeah. the character that is really, that we really have to talk about that you can't get away from is Mohit. Yeah. Um, because he stands in for the problem yeah. of being that age of yeah. of being so compelled by by your experience of sexual feelings yeah and yet not understanding boundaries not understanding other people's lives you know yeah. and and how you are transgressing on other people yeah um because he is a creep or he yeah. be, he's he's being creepy why mohit or a character like mohit in in a film like this yeah uh so for me, this is a story of post pubescent years of this bunch of kids and India. Yeah. Both. Yeah. So the liberalization was when India hit puberty in my head. Okay. And then we got so much of this exposure to this stuff, cable TV and you know, whatever, everything came, MNC jobs and uh foreign travels, seeing foreign for the first time in our, in our cinema, not just as a backdrop to a song, but was the charm of that particular time when you suddenly you realize, okay, the world is bigger than what we knew. There's a world outside our home. We can go out, meet people, date, whatever, or at least have the possibility. And in that moment of that post-pubescent freedom you get, you do stupid things. You don't know what to do with this thing. You don't know what to do with this sudden power with no responsibility kind of a space you get. And, and access, so much shame at the same yeah, time. And access and shame and confused feelings about who you really are. Are yeah. you that kid who is supposed to be this very good mannered kid at home or you are supposed to be this rowdy you know, creep kind of a person, but you still don't know your boundaries. You still don't know what to do with this sexual energy and freedom and this hubris also that comes with that age. So that's something which this kid also does. He has unresolved lots of sexual energy and he has access to a phone which he, kids of the previous generation did not. And he used that. Similarly, how India big statement, but India got so much power in that post-liberalization phase, but we did not know what to do with that. And that turned into some kind of further repression, which, and I, I'm very sure we all can guess which party Mohit votes today <laughs> when he grows up, that 17-year-old kid 20 years later, 
who is he voting and why is he voting for yeah. that one party okay i've never really thought about how my puberty might have coincided in some ways with india's sort of cultural and economic puberty although it's a very easy argument to make maybe every generation can make it definitely our generation can make it yeah and i i must say i loved that the that all india rank sort of hit all well hit what i might call the holy trinity of sexual awakening in uh, in my life yeah one of which is rangila. music videos from rangila yeah uh, one of which is Pooja Bhatt and Rahul Roy kissing in uh, Phir Teri Kahani Aadai. That was the first time ever we saw Indian people kissing on screen genuinely. Not, not that fake awkward kiss. A genuine kiss full of love and lust and, and genuine emotion. I was going to say the, the cover of Stardust. Yes, that, that also. The, yeah. You're talking about uh, this... Film magazine cover. Achha, that, any that, cover that, that, or you're talking about a specific one? Cover. Literally okay. any cover. Okay. It's how I remember it. Yeah. And okay. the third thing is the dictionary. Which... Yeah, there was something we wanted to use in the film. We could not... Actually, I think there was some rights issue. But because it was a shoe ad of uh, Milan Soman and... Tufts. You know. Yeah, Milan Soman and... Uh, Madhu Sapre. Madhu Sapre, yeah like just wrapped around in a snake or something and just wearing the shoes and nothing else you didn't uh, need that that is that's maybe too too on point but <laughs> yeah but yeah stardust covers yeah. absolutely yeah they were our, our whatever sexual literature and dictionary yes very much and the dictionary example is an important one because it does sort of demonstrate how at that age if so sensitive to to these provocations that simply the words that are the definition of <laughs> i mean yeah this is the, no everyone knows about everyone yeah, knows yeah. about the dictionary definition yeah, yeah. of the dif dictionary definition of sex i'm glad it was in the film it uh, it chimed i'm sure with lots of people and although mohit is not a good not a great kid it reminded you it reminded me that being sympathetic to the to the to the kind of compulsion and the difficulty of handling sexual arousal mm -hmm. and sexual impulses at that age is is important you yes. know i i think that there's something i've i think we've all had to think about in recent years because we've had a huge cultural reckoning with our sexual norms and and improving sexual behavior like mm -hmm. consent and yeah between people and a lot of that is came to be focused on very young people and what seemed to me to be missing from that conversation was a useful conversation about what is happening to young people's bodies mm. and their ability yeah. and what they need in order to to exercise better co control mm. control being this key word in the film. yeah yeah and yeah. uh and one of those things is candid sexual education mm which is something that does not exist in yeah, the film. Yeah, or exactly. In the... in the film also. So, in an ideal scenario when Mohit does that in the PCO, someone should have sat him down and talked to him and, you know, like asked him how can we help instead of like beating him in public view, which is with, with where violence, uh, another chunk of violence comes in the film, mm -hmm. where R.K. Singh barges into the PCO and drags him out and shames him publicly and, you know, beats him up and all that. So that's, again, that's, a, that's uh, exactly how our nation behaves, right? How India behaved with the idea of uh, sexual liberation in a way and it's still like we still get probably one horrible uh, court judgment every week about live-in couples should not be allowed to live in or uh, whatever there was this some Uttarakhand government. Uh, you have yeah. to inform the cops the day and the moment you started your relationship and all. So we are still dealing like our kissing in the film with anyone trying to do something about their sexuality yeah. though in the film of course the guy does something horrible with, with whatever power he has but still violence is not the answer yeah. but that's how we we have uh, seen things uh, 
around us and it has not changed. The film is set in the 90s and we are still seeing similar, exactly similar things. Yeah. So the puberty, post-puberty phase is kind of going on for a long time. It's been 25 years. <laughs> You're still in the middle of it. And that brings me to our third subject, dreaming. Now, I chose the word uh, dreaming deliberately and it's not dreams because I didn't want to make it sound like aspiration. Yeah. Which is obviously the most overused and overburdened word about, you know, relating to India of the last, yeah. of this century. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the things to appreciate about All India Rank is that the main character pretty much lacks aspiration. Yeah. That's, that's almost his defining trait. But what he has what all people, everyone has, and especially has at that age, mm. is a very rich life of the mind and of emotions mm. that is not entirely conscious and deliberate, that's not, that, that's sort of somewhere in this gray zone of, of, of semi-conscious emotion and sensitivity. Mm. Most of all, it's just a sensitivity to the world, to music, to friendship, to art, and everyone remembers this about being that age. Your characters have that. Yeah. It's something that uh, that comes out in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And one of them is the way you use illustration and graphic yeah. uh, elements. Yeah. So to tell me about bringing that out. Hmm. So, uh, first of all, thank you for talking about dreaming and be it being different from dreams. Because right. dreaming is one of my favorite things to do in this, <laughs> you know, uh, whatever, in the 90s actually, 90s were actually, I kind of remember that decade as a decade of dreaming about life and then you grow up and then dreams become a version of reality and that version of reality, no matter how close they are to the dreams you had, is never as fulfilling. So dreaming is, is a fun job i think one of one of the funnest things are the most satisfying things you can do at that age and uh, it was a big part of my life at that age uh, which no one tells you at that age but when you grow up it becomes uh, a kind of anxiety when you grow up because your You're ability from... to imagine scenarios in these times is not a very good scenario building, you know, you end up thinking of the worst case scenarios, which doesn't happen at that time. So for me, dreaming is a big, big part of growing up or just before growing up, you know, that age between 15 and 18 and 19. Uh, you think of all the possibilities of the future and also for the first time in your life, you can look back like, recent history and try to assess that and that phase is fantastic and that phase is something which i miss seeing in uh, cinema or any kind of you know literature uh, representation also that phase mm -hmm. is missing and that is one of the warmest feedback i'm getting from a lot of people the current gen z's who, you know, we didn't even know how much they'll connect with this world. Sometimes they are confused about a lot of period details and, you know, PCO and all. Uh, what but, is he doing with his wrist? Yeah, but they are totally connecting to that dreaminess, that state of feeling confused and finding solace when you close your eyes and you imagine the scenarios and you imagine, okay, this is what could be. And so that was the intent and then we didn't know how to do it. How to bring those scenarios to visuals, I didn't know, like probably two months before the shoot began. We were still thinking, okay, we'll shoot some of these portions. We actually, so there's this shot of pencils falling down in a rain. Like rain. Yeah, we actually, uh, you know, like tried Googling, is there a way where you know, we can buy 10,000 pencils and is there a machine we can build which can, you know, <laughs> rain them down and all. <laughs> and it was, uh, then uh, I met Ellen Shaw, who is the animator of the film, uh, who did the title design, the first posters. He's an illustrator, artist, animator. 
so i knew of ellen's work and we had chatted a, a, a few times about his work and i really like his uh watercolor illustrations they all they have that dreamy quality to it as opposed to you know any any other kind of sketching sketches feel too real to you know too precise too precise and watercolors because they have their own way of occupying the space because there are no uh, defined strokes right he just lets the water do its thing and right. you know some at some place the color is really sharp and then it's dull then it's flowing and all so that quality i really liked and so we started chatting about if he can do something on the film ellen gave that dreaminess or gave visuals to that dreaminess portions or dreaming portions of the film because ellen was doing the watercolor illustrations and paint uh, the animations for the film archana ghangrekar the cinematographer and mehak uh, who is the colorist on the film we actually sat together and we decided decided that the palette of the film will be closer to the watercolor yeah. and the second thing is slightly connected is psychological actually uh all of us no matter how old we become uh, like as time passes major chunk of our dreams like actual dreaming night time mm-hmm. sleep okay app is consists of uh, uh, the time we spend between the ages of 12 and 19 really so yeah we do most of our dreaming at that age no so even at 40 you'll be dreaming It's about that so even if you 20 years later also wow. at 60 also most of your dreams in most of your dreams you'll be between those age ages 12 and 19 because that's when you start kind of taking in the world and storing and at that time the brain probably is super hungry for data and the brain doesn't know that there is more data coming man there like lots of but that's the magical data. quality of being that age is yeah, the way so you brain is like oh wow okay something is coming let's stamp it like seal it store it this is not going anywhere and then later the later part of the memory is what you start making 20 22 year onwards brain is like sorry uh, there is no more that's space cool. now so it's only that chunk so in that way also the film is connected to the the period when we make most of our dreams for the rest of our lives is actually a period of dreaming also i had no idea that's really interesting well, i'm glad I'm glad that this dreaming uh, kind of uh, rubric makes sense to you and one of the things that it includes that the world of this of this youthful dreaming includes which i liked is that it includes learning Yeah, you know, for a film set in Kota in which the educational system is not necessarily the good guy, yeah, uh, you didn't make learning uh, into the bad guy, and and yeah, to that end, the, there's a character who reminds us and reminds the, Vivek, the protagonist, that there is a good way for this that this should be happening, and this character is Sarika, yeah, his female classmate, yeah, who is both an artist. Hmm. and someone with a more sorted relationship to what she's doing in quota than yeah. than he is yeah uh within most of what sarika says which when when she talks about her relationship to physics for instance yeah. uh there are there are examples that sort of straddle the world of physics and the world of imagination mm Yeah. and i felt like those were things that you wrote in there because yeah. they also ignited your imagination yeah yeah so i had I had a very good relationship with physics huh. when i was young and uh, i knew a couple of uh, you didn't like, hear that much actually yeah no But, i i i loved physics and a big part of the whatever reason was that uh, my younger brother uh, was too much into physics he loved physics he wanted to 
uh, you know, like Sarika, he wanted to do that for the rest of his life and he is doing that, in fact, he's right now a professor of physics in uh, San Diego University. Huh. So, uh, so he actually showed me what physics is actually or the beauty of physics and how, how it is in everything around us and how it is uh, mysterious and fun and all and not just a boring subject in the, you know, in the textbooks and all. So that was partly, I mean, Sarika emerged from, from seeing how my brother kind of was fascinated by physics. Ah. Uh, another thing was because there is this in the film also and generally in life, there is this spectrum of students you meet and everyone has a different relationship with, uh, with this competitive exam. Some people do it because the society has brainwashed them into it. Some people do it because they are like too casual and kind of they, they can walk through it, some, some of them. And they don't know if they want to do it, but it's an acquisition of sorts for them. So I wanted to have one character who does it for the love of it. As someone pointed out, a feminist critique of Sarika's character, that she is too burdened with the idea of being this good student who does things. And she, she is not allowed the mindless joy of other students or the mindless perversion of one student or the, or the feeling of sadness even what Rinku goes through or, you know. Mm -hmm. So there are these very human qualities or human vulnerabilities, whatever, vulnerabilities which she is kind of devoid of and she is carrying the burden of being this ideal student in a way. Uh, and that is a very fine critique actually, very insightful. It is a good point. And at the same time, I'm still glad that there was a character that, you know, the film doesn't succumb to the cynicism or the hostility to the system to the extent where uh, where it where it reduces the actual material they're learning yeah. into the enemy. Yeah, I, I thought about this later. You know, the this is not a spoiler. The opening scene of the film is is a blackboard, and what's on the blackboard in another in a different treatment of the subject. What's on the blackboard might be it might be covered in formulae and equations. It might be covered in the kind of overwhelming amount of in, of of stuff that students are forced to learn that would be one way of conveying what you're saying about this but instead what you put on that blackboard first is the figure pi i i it starts with i yeah and eventually it's the uh it's an incredibly elegant and almost magical equation called yeah. the eulers eulers formula eulers formula that's yeah. right. And uh, Euler's identity, actually. Yeah. Among the many good reasons to watch this film, one is that it will make an attempt to introduce you to Euler's identity. Magical, that equation, because, yeah, it, uh, you know, it has like four different things, E, I, pi, and uh, one, and then zero also. So zero is like probably the core of uh, a lot of philosophical discussion uh, across centuries uh, among scholars. So zero is also there, one is also there, which is like the uh, the representation of so many things in philosophical sense, in mathematical sense, then E and I and pi all come from different systems of mathematics. All of that combines in one equation without adding anything, without putting any other, you know, brackets or in simply all of that can combine into a graceful equation, which looks too simple to even be real and yeah. it is there and uh, that when I found out long back when I read about this probably in college or something the philosophical implications of this equation being real uh, existing in our world uh, I was blown away and I thought that's like definitely I'm going to use it in some and sacred games there was no space to use that equation <laughs> so, <laughs> so so I thought okay this is the film where this equation can make some sense. So, yeah. It does. Varun, thanks so much. Thank you. Lovely talking. Great talking.